Picture me, a lot younger, much smaller, and with a really bad haircut. <laughs> okay, now this is what happens when your mom trims your hair and she wants your bangs to be perfectly straight. <laughs> and it was at this time in my life that my family went to one of the fanciest places in New Orleans. It was a dinner theater at the Roosevelt Hotel. Imagine chandeliers on the ceiling and a stage up front with a singer doing Broadway hits. And at the end of his set, he invites up all us little kids up on stage. And he goes, now what do y'all want to be when you grow up? So one by one, you're hearing a fireman, doctor, lawyer, teacher. Then he turns to me. Darling, now what do you want to be when you grow up? Superman! <laughs> okay, so that audience reacted a lot like you, but back then, to my ears, it sounded so much louder. <laughs> oh my God, I was surprised, I was confused because I wasn't trying to be funny. When I shouted out Superman, that wasn't a fantasy. That was my career plan. And you know what, as I look back on it, that Superman syndrome kind of stayed with me, and in a good way. That's what pushed me to the highest achievements in my career. But when it comes to personal goals, not so much. So what's the difference? I can tell you in one word. Deadlines. You know, in business, we got to get things out in a certain time frame, but in our personal lives, you know, not really. That may explain why there's a writer I know, and they've been talking about a book idea for like uh, two years, and just now we're getting words on paper. Guilty as charged. But what about you? And you. And you. What, what is a personal goal that maybe you haven't started or you've never finished because somehow you're worried that it might not be as super as you imagined. And you know what? It doesn't have to be a big, bold, bodacious goal. It could be something simple like exercise. Let me tell you about a colleague of mine. Comes into work really upset because she didn't get to do her morning bike ride. Was the bike broken? No. Was she injured? No. She was just running late. And then she realized, gee, I only have 30 minutes and my perfect bike ride is two hours. So she chose to do nothing over doing something that would have been less than perfect. And that's what I mean when I say the perfect excuse. And by the way, she's not alone, come on. We've all done that, haven't we? We've pulled out the perfect excuse to not do our goals. Before I get into why, I'd like to do a little experiment and you can make some money on this. <laughs> All right. I have here a $100 bill. Will you verify? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll this up as tight as I can. When you're doing a talk on perfection, it helps if you have deep pockets. <laughs> so. I'm going to put this in the balloon. Everybody with me? Okay, here we go. <sighs> no, come on. We can do better than that. Now, someone's going to walk away with this $100 tonight. Before I ask for volunteers, let me explain the rules. I'm going to be holding this up as high as I can. If you come up on stage, you cannot pull my arm down. But you can reach for it, you can stretch for it, you can jump for it, and if you get the balloon, the $100 is yours. For real. Raise your hand if you'd like to volunteer. 
Okay, I'm seeing a lot of volunteers here. Apparently, you've noticed that I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> All right, put your hands down. We've got to make this a little more interesting. I'm going to raise the bar. All right, now when I reach up as high as I can, this is 10 feet off the ground. And just to give you a little perspective, that's the same height as an NBA basketball goal. Okay, Dirk, if you're in the audience, you cannot come up on this. <laughs> okay, before I ask for volunteers, I really think it's only fair that I mention if you trip on your way up here, or perhaps you jump for this and don't make it, this is being taped. And this could go viral. <laughs> and that would be kind of good for me, but not so good for you. Oh, and it's also posted on the TED site, which means it's out there for all the world to see forever. Okay, so if you want to come up on stage, <laughs> raise your hand. All right, I still have a few brave souls, I must say, a lot fewer than before and one or two hands are a lot lower than they were last time. <laughs> as if they're going, please don't pick me, please don't pick me, please don't pick me. You put your hands down because guess what? This experiment isn't gonna happen up here. It is happening in here. This is what Einstein called a thought experiment. So I want you to think about how you felt when the balloon was here, right? People felt like, hey, that's what's in, within reach. I could probably get that. And you know what else? I could use 100 bucks. <laughs> so let's see how you feel now. <laughs> okay, I hope you observed what happened there. First of all, someone reached and got their goal. Congratulations. But she wasn't the only one. I noticed there were a number of people that thought they had a shot at that, and they went for it but you guys didn't go for it on this side. And you know what? Way over here, I didn't see you guys going for it. The people in the back, you weren't jumping out of your seats, were you? Because in your mind, you were thinking, no way. That's just too far out of reach. Much like when I put that balloon up 10 feet in the air. And it's the same with our goals. If we set the bar too high, we don't try. If we set the bar too high, we don't try. So how high is too high? For some people, the goal of living on Mars is not too high. So the trick for each of us is, how do we set that bar to the very highest point, but where we still believe we can reach it? And you know, there was one other part to this experiment you may have noticed I mentioned the possibility for embarrassment on a global scale. <laughs> so how often do we do that to ourselves? You know, we exaggerate what the consequences are if we should just fall short of what our goal is. Why is that? What's going on psychologically? Well, I've had some people say, you know what? It's a fear of failure. You know, you may be a high achiever, but you don't believe in yourself enough. You suffer from low self-esteem. I have another theory. What if it's not self-esteem that's too low, but self-esteem that's so high, we can't bear to have anything that might take us down a notch, maybe just in our own minds? That's a whole different thing. That is not a fear of failure. That's a fear of falling short of fabulous. Now, let's get into that a little bit more. How would you finish this sentence? And think about the first thing that comes to your mind. You read that? When I ask my high-powered clients about this, you know what I hear most often? The enemy of great is good. It's people who don't push themselves to do their best. And for some people, that is an issue. But not for high achievers. For high achievers, the enemy of great isn't good. The enemy of great is perfect. Now, one of the first people to observe this was the great French philosopher, Voltaire. 
This is way back in the 17th century. And in the 21st century, the great Canadian philosopher, Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> okay, so we have a few philosophy majors, obviously, who recognize that. For those of you who aren't familiar, Wayne Gretzky is the legendary ice hockey player, and he is famous for making his goals. But what I remember him for is making this statement. I miss 100% of the shots I never take. So what shots are you not taking? Because if you're waiting for something to get to perfect, you may never even get a shot. Somebody's going to beat you to it. And nobody understood that better than the founder of LinkedIn. You know what his advice is? If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you launch too late. And let me tell you, he walked the talk. Take a look at the very first homepage of LinkedIn. <laughs> All right, that's just an artist's rendering by my favorite six-year-old. But you can Google the real thing. And let me tell you, it isn't that far off. Now, LinkedIn is successful because they're not focused on perfect. They're focused on purpose. And their purpose is to connect up business people all over the world. They launched with a less than perfect website. And then they improved it over time, right? And now they have over 400 million members around the world connecting on their site. And there's a lesson here in business that we can apply to personal goals. Get something good out there, something great can happen. And there's lots of other examples, like with crowdfunding. Now, one startup that caught my eye is called Cuddle and Kind, and it's a business started by a young family, and they had a goal on a personal level that they wanted to be able to feed one million hungry children every year. So they did a four-month campaign, and they were on the crowdfunding site Indiegogo. They raised close to a half a million dollars. They used that to purchase dolls that were handmade. And then from the profits, they helped fund world food charities. And it was such a success that there was a story on them. And one question that came up is, hey, if you were to do it all over again, would you do anything differently? And they went, yes. Yes, we would. We would have delayed our launch because we didn't have time to really coordinate as well as we would have liked our media coverage. Now, that's a legitimate but perfect excuse. And let me just say, it's pretty good that they didn't think of that before they already fed thousands of hungry children. You don't have to have everything lined up perfectly. Just get something good out there and something great can happen. Now, one of the most painful ways that the perfect excuse comes up, I think we've all been there, we compare ourselves to others, yeah? So I have a friend of mine who plays the guitar just for fun, and he's, you know what, he's pretty good. And one day we were talking, and he was telling me about when he went and saw Eric Clapton in concert. And he was saying, I was sitting there, and I was thinking, man, this guy is so great. And then by the time I left the concert at the end, I'm going, why do I even try? Now, what's funny is, Eric Clapton felt the exact same way the first time he met <laughs> Jimi Hendrix. So at the time, Clapton was part of a band called Cream, and they were considered the best of the best. Clapton was like the Superman of guitar players. Jimi Hendrix, unknown. But his manager knew the band, and he asked the favor, hey, can Jimmy just come up on stage while you're playing in this club at London? And, you know, he'll just jam with you for, like, one song. So they went, okay. So that night, Jimi Hendrix gets on stage. He plugs his electric guitar in to the amp, and then he plays out of his mind. He's got the guitar behind his head. He's got it under his leg. At one point, he is literally playing the guitar with his teeth. So while he's doing that, Clapton's over here, and he can't believe what he's seeing. He stops playing, and then he walks off the stage. Now, Eric Clapton wasn't mad. He just was blown away by what became the Jimi Hendrix experience, and he was thinking, 
Why do I even try? And that was his perfect excuse to leave. Now, when he was backstage, he was visibly shaking when he turned to Jimmy's manager and he goes, you didn't tell me he was that flippin' good. Now, he didn't use those exact words because he, <laughs> he was a rock star, right? But that was the gist of it. And to his credit, he did play with Hendrix and some other gigs and they became friends. So Eric Clapton found a way to get over it. How are we going to get over our perfect excuses? I'd like to wrap up with a story that's a real-life example of a Superman, although he would never claim to be one. I want you to meet Brian Robbins. Over the course of his life, Brian was a three-time All-American diver, a U.S. Olympic coach. He earned his third-degree black belt in Aikido, his seventh-degree black belt in Taekwondo. You know, as I'm looking at Brian, I think he looks less like Superman and more like Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? <laughs> I felt so honored to just be in his martial arts class, but not everybody felt that way. One day, while we were in class, a new guy comes in. You know, he's late, the door kind of slams. We all kind of turn around. Have you ever had this happen where somebody enters the room and you just know trouble's about to happen? Well, on this day, trouble was 6'1", 185 pounds, 18 years old, with a whole lot of attitude. Brian is at the front of the class, and he's shown us some new move. And this guy just blurts out, Hey, I know like three different guys who could beat you up. Now put yourself in Brian's place. You'd have every right to be angry. So what would you do? Would you throw this guy out of the class? Would you call him up on the mat and throw him in the class? Brian didn't do either of those. That guy goes, hey, I know three different guys who could beat you up. And he just smiles. He goes, really? Only three? Then I'm better than I thought. <laughs> you know, that attitude of, so what if somebody's better than me? So what if I'm not perfect? That's exactly the mindset that I try and channel every time I'm tempted to use the perfect excuse. And it reminds me, i got to shift my focus from perfect to purpose. So what if Eric Clapton cannot play the guitar like Jimi Hendrix? He plays like Eric Clapton, and that's great. So what if that startup didn't have their media coverage lined up perfectly? They've already fed close to 190,000 hungry children, and that's great. So what if my book, or this TED Talk, or your project isn't perfect. Why don't we just get something good out there so something great can happen. Thank you.